To stay up to date on all the voting rights and election news you need, click on the link above to subscribe to Democracy Docket's daily and weekly newsletters. How we draw maps determines who has power in the United States. No one knows this better than Attorney General Eric Holder, chair of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. This is Defending Democracy, a weekly podcast from Democracy Docket. I'm Mark Elias. Let's get started. Thank you, Attorney General Eric Holder, for joining Defending Democracy. Always good to see you, Mark. Uh, You're a great person to work with, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So, you know, I want to start with uh, a fact that I'm not sure everyone in the audience knows about you. Obviously, everyone knows that you were the attorney general of the United States, that you were a civil rights litigator, you were a line prosecutor, you were a U.S. attorney, but you were also, uh, for a period of time, a judge uh, in the Superior Court in Washington, D.C., which is one of the court systems that we have here. And, you know, I wonder from your perch of having been both in the position that Merrick Garland is now in as attorney general and also in the position of some of these judges, what you make of how the criminal justice system at at writ large is handling the Donald Trump indictments. Uh, It seems like the the judges and the system are under an enormous amount of stress. And you seem like a unique person who has seen it from literally every angle. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think the judicial system has handled the Trump cases particularly well. And I think this is really in stark contrast to the way in which I think the judicial system dealt with the challenges Uh, during the 2020 election cycle, you know, many of which, you know, you handle 60 cases, you know, whatever the number was. Um, There, I I thought we saw the courts respond rapidly, appropriately uh, to, you know, some spurious um, challenges. Now we are are, are witnessing slowdowns, um, delays that are consistent with what, um, you know, defendant Trump wants to have happen. Um, I I look at the the Florida case, the, the documents case, you know, Judge Cannon there is, I mean, I, you know, I'd like to think that things are on the up and up there, um, but it, it becomes increasingly more difficult, um, you know, to believe that. The Supreme Court, when it comes to the really kind of bogus, um, you know, immunity claim that the former president has uh, has made, you know, waits two weeks to decide before it actually is going to um, hear the case and then waits, I guess, seven weeks before scheduling um, arguments. The Supreme Court has the capacity to act quickly. We have seen the the court do that. Bush versus Gore, the Nixon case, you know, that they decide death penalty issues, you know, virtually, um, you know, and literally overnight. Um, And so these delays, I think, are really kind of unnecessary and push information uh, that the American people should have. And that is the, you know, the determination of guilt or innocence, information that the United that um, citizens of the United States ought to have before the election makes it, I think, less likely that that, in fact, is going to happen. I think the New York state case is likely to go forward. Uh, I think the possibility exists for the, the D.C. January 6th case to go forward. But f- between Florida and Atlanta, uh, I'm not at all certain we're going to see those cases resolved um, before the election. So, um I mentioned you were the attorney general uh, when you left office, uh, you returned to private practice and you undoubtedly had a million demands on your time. And you decided, uh, explicably or inexplicably, well, we're about to find out, to take on the challenge of redistricting, uh, which is one of the most corrosive, um, can be one of the most corrosive things to American democracy. You decided to take on the challenge of fair districting and all that comes with it as really, frankly, central to your life's work. Um, I'm just curious, as you looked out on the landscape, <laughs> why why did you choose why did you choose redistricting? Well, you know, as I was leaving, I was trying to think about all right, what is it that I want to continue to do in my private life once I've left um, government? One of the things that I had really emphasized as AG was the protection of voting rights. All right, so I tried to try to break that down. Uh, and it seemed to me that the practice of partisan and racial gerrymandering was probably among the most corrosive things uh, that we had seen in terms of our democracy. And I thought, all right, you know, I looked at what happened in 2011 and what Republicans did there and the gerrymanders that they put in place and the impact that had at, at the state level as well as the federal level in terms of who was served in the you know, United States House of Representatives and made a determination, let's, you know, how about, let's make the 2021 um, redistricting fair. 
I mean, how about that? Just, just let's just make it fair, because you know my theory of the case is that if it's fair, uh, if our voting systems are fair, if uh, our, our redistricting process is fair, if the census is done in in a fair way, Democrats, progressives will do just fine. We will do just fine, and I think you know the work that we have done, uh, you know, with you, you know, at the tip of the spear has had a really, you know, substantial impact. I mean, going into the 2024 election, the congressional map is highly competitive for both parties. And that's a far cry from the way it was in, in, in 2011. Um, you know, a good competitive map is, is good for, for Democrats, progressives, as I said, but it's also good for our democracy because that's the way in which the people have the ability to select representatives who they want to serve as opposed to a system that the Republicans put in place uh, in, in 2011, where congressmen, state legislators were picking their voters. And that's inconsistent with, um, you know, who we're supposed to be as, as a nation. I mean, you look at the 2022 midterms, um, the New York Times has said that this is the fairest congressional map that we've seen in the last, uh, the last 40 years, as opposed to what happened in 2011 when Princeton University did a study and said that was the worst uh, redistricting in terms of gerrymandering of the previous half century. So, you know, we've made a lot of, of progress in states like, oh, you know, Wisconsin, something's just unwound there um, last week. Uh, Michigan is in a fundamentally better place. A number of, of states are just in, in, in better places. Um, and so more states have fairer congressional and legislative maps going into, into 2024 than they did going into the 2022 midterms. You know, one of the things that's interesting is that the American people have not voted on the same congressional map uh, since 2014. 2016 was different than 14, 18, 16. And every two years we get, um, we get different maps. And at least part of that is because we, you and I, have been in this fight to try to make um, the system more fair and trying to undo the damage that was done in that 2011 um, process. And just one last thing here to give people kind of a, a concrete sense of this. In, in 2012, this is the first election after the 2011 redistricting process, Democrats running for Congress across the country earned 1.4 million votes than Republicans. So 1.4 million more votes and Republicans had a 33-seat majority in the United States House of Representatives. So look, 1.4 million fewer votes, 33 more seats. That gives you a sense of um, you know, what the 2011 redistricting process was like. So our goal is not partisan. I really want to emphasize that. Our, our goal is for America to have a more representative democracy, and our goal is to make sure that everyone's vote um, counts and that every voice is actually um, heard. Yeah, so I want to connect um, your first answer to what you just said. Um, you know, at the risk of picking on the U.S. Supreme Court, um, the 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 folks in South Carolina, um, it seems to me, are suffering a lev level of of judicial um, inactivity and neglect to their constitutional rights. It is really inexcusable. Right. So for people who don't who haven't followed this, um, the after the maps were drawn in South Carolina, um, a group of voters represented, I think, by the ACLU and the um, NAACP brought a racial gerrymandering claim saying that the district that is held by Nancy Mace, a, a conservative Republican, that black voters had been essentially moved out of that district um, in on based on race. And, you know, the, the three-judge panel agreed with the plaintiffs that the map was, in fact, a deprivation of the constitutional rights of the black voters. Um, and then the case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and, you know, it was, I believe, one of the first cases to be heard this term. It was heard right. um, in early October. The parties, including, by the way, I guess to their credit, the state of South Carolina actually said to the Supreme Court at the time it was being argued, look, can you get us an answer by, uh, by January 1 and we can implement whatever? Well, now fast forward, the Supreme Court still hasn't ruled on the case. And, you know, essentially the courts have now ruled that it's too late, no matter how the Supreme Court rules, for 2024. And so these black voters who frankly did everything right, went to court, you know, proved their case, um, are now stuck with illegal maps again. And I'm just, like, I am rarely at a loss for words, but I am at a loss for words to understand how the U.S. Supreme Court was operating here. Well, I think what is happening in South Carolina serves as a, 
you know, a painful um, reminder that the Roberts Court has been no friend to voting rights. Um, you know, this is part of, I think, from my perspective, a disturbing pattern by the Supreme Court of taking, you know, far too long to rule on redistricting cases, and it has resulted in millions of voters, and as you might expect, particularly voters of color, being forced to vote on discriminatory maps. I mean, in the South Carolina case, what you said is really worth emphasizing. In the South Carolina case, both of the parties to the case, both of the parties to the case asked the court to rule by January of this year, and they still haven't received a decision. I mean, that's ridiculous. One of the first cases to be argued. I mean, that reminds me of the voting rights case, you know, our voting rights case coming out of Alabama, Allen yeah. versus Milligan. No, 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 make no mistake in that, in that instance, the court ultimately made, you know, the right decision last year. But the fact is that the court issued a stay in 2022 in that case. And that's the only reason that the lawsuit and the Voting Rights Act challenges in Louisiana, Georgia and Texas were not decided ahead of the 2022 election. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you end up with the court with these delays, having people vote on constitutional maps, vote on maps that the courts have already determined are unconstitutional or that violate the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You know, um, <laughs> these unnecessarily de delays force, um, again, voters to you know vote in on maps deemed to be um, discriminatory. And this isn't about one party or the other. This is about equal representation. And as I always get back to, this is about kind of fundamental fairness and, you know, what our democracy is supposed to be about. I mean, the court had to know with both parties saying, you know, decide by January 1st, including the defendant, you know, including South Carolina. And here we are. They're not going to decide the case in time. And people in South Carolina, as people in Alabama, are going to be voting on maps that um, are illegal. So one of the most insightful things that I have heard you talk about in the context of redistricting, in the context of, of voting rights, but I actually think it has an even broader application, frankly, to a lot of, of politics and a lot of law, is, the, is that what in many respects we have seen these Republican legislatures try to do is to exercise power. That this is not just, you know, sometimes I think, in, particularly in Washington, D.C., people think that this is just like a, a game, you know, of, of who's up, who's down. But that, but that this is actually about the ability to exercise political power with a minor, without achieving a majority of popular support. And I wonder if you could talk about that, because I really think it is such a powerful way to understand so much of what we have all experienced in the last, frankly, since 2016. Yeah, when it comes to uh, racial and partisan gerrymandering, uh, voter suppression, uh, unnecessary voter purges, it's really all about uh, the acquisition and the maintenance of power. I mean, I think we need to understand that this is about power. Republicans, too many Republicans, have made peace with the notion that in terms of popular support, they will be a minority party a minority party that exercises majority power. This is what they want to have the ability to do, to put in place um, you know, policies that are inconsistent with what the majority of the American people want to do, but really will protect the interests who the Republican Party are tied to. And they're pursuing you know, a long-term strategy to attain that political power, and central to that strategy, I think, is, is gerrymandering. It's one of the reasons why I decided to focus on it, you know, leaving um, government. You know, we find ourselves now, um, because of this desire to hold on to power and the central, um, the centrality of, of, of redistricting, kind of, we're in an era of like perpetual redistricting, uh, where we have to continue to use every tool at our disposal to stop them from doing what they're going to do. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, it was really interesting. Um, Speaker Johnson ran a, I guess what I call a victory lap on an extraordinarily egregious gerrymander in North Carolina, yep. you know, a state where, you know, we took a gerrymander down. Um, it's a 50 50 state. And as a result of the work that we did, you ended up with a, a map of seven Republicans, seven Democrats going to the House of Representatives. That represents kind of what North Carolina looks like. It's likely that after what they have done after a really egregious state Supreme Court decision, they're likely to go back to something like 10 to 4. Um, and this is something that Speaker Johnson, 
said was a, was a good thing. As I said, he took a victory lap, and he said the quiet part out loud, that Republicans, again, have made gerrymandering a central part of their strategy uh, to achieve a House majority and to hold on to power, power. That's what all of this is, uh, that is really all, all about. Um, it's why you see not just the, you know, these extreme views um, put into place, but also, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, the dysfunction, you know, that we are seeing in, in our in our government, because we have a focus not because of because of gerrymandering. People don't care about a general election. Um, they care about only not being primary, which drives Republicans further and further to the right, um, means that you don't reach across the aisle to come up with uh, common sense compromises because that's seen as, as a sign of weakness and invites, um, you know, a primary challenger. So, you know, gerrymandering has um, a whole range of negative um, impacts um, on our society. And, you know, one concrete thing, if you look at all the polling that has been done, the people, not in one state poll have you seen uh, people say, we wanted Roe versus Wade overturned. Now, the margins are different, admittedly, between New York and, say, I don't know, Texas, Oklahoma, something like that. And yet we have seen these draconian anti-choice laws put into place at the state legislative level by these um, gerrymandered state legislatures that, again, inconsistent with the desires of the people, but these Republicans holding on to their power and not fearing any loss, or any loss in a general election, um, do that which they want to do, which is to take reproductive rights away from um, people in this country, um, serve the special interests that they are aligned with, uh, and realize that they will suffer no political consequence, um, you know, as a result. Yeah. So one of the things that you've really innovated, um, I think, in terms of redistricting uh, is, you know, we talked a lot about the the some of the legal cases, um, Alabama, we could talk about Louisiana, um, uh, uh, some more, uh, but one of the things that I think that that you did that you've done in your leadership is you've kind of married together kind of a traditional legal strategy, which I'm thrilled to work with you on, and you and I have done pretty well for ourselves. Um, but you've married it with um, with a grassroots strategy to sort of get people understand and engaged in this in the States. And also what I'll call, for lack of a better term, a more sort of true political strategy, you know, uh, making sure that good people get elected, you know, making sure that, that um, uh, for example, where you have judicial elections. And that's an area that, you know, frankly, has historically not been paid attention to. And talk a little bit, you know, I don't think, I don't think we, for example, would have had the success, in fact, I know we would not have had success as a, a royal we as a country in Wisconsin without the work that you did kind of across those various vectors. Um, so talk a little bit about your how you think about the law versus how you think about, you know, grassroots pressure versus how you think about elections. Yeah, you know, I think it's um, it's an all hands on deck, use every strategy every tactic, every technique that you can to achieve that, um, that goal of fairness. Yes, we have been, I think, really, I think remarkably successful when it comes to the litigation, you know, that we have brought, but that's not the only thing that we have done. We have also done political things to support candidates who would stand for, um, for fairness. And it means supporting candidates, you know, at the state level. Um, Democrats, I don't think, had ne have necessarily focused enough uh, on state level um, elections, and local elections as well. And so we have stood for, stood with candidates who will stand for electoral um, fairness. And it means, you know, supporting um, governors who will do so, state legislators who will do so. It means also trying to figure out well, who's involved in the, um, the redistricting process, state Supreme Court justices, the auditor. Um, in, in, in Ohio, um, secretaries of state. These are, are, are places where we decided to, um, to place our focus. Then I think we also had to raise the consciousness of the people in this country about the importance of redistricting and make them understand that redistricting, gerrymandering, are not some kind of ephemeral, um, you know, political thing that you can't understand. We had to tie um, what gerrymandering means to uh, their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And certainly we see it now with regard to reproductive rights. Uh, we see it with regard to protecting the right to vote, criminal justice reform, climate. There's a whole range of things that are tied directly to uh, 
uh, who serves in state legislatures, who serves in the United States House of Representatives, uh, and how these people are selected. And so uh, that's the, we've tried to take, as I said, this kind of, you know, all hands on deck, all technique um, a, a approach. Let's get, let's galvanize the American people to get concerned about this problem. Let's sue where we have to. Uh, let's put in place, um, you know, reform measures like uh, these uh, independent commissions that we supported. The best one, I think, is perhaps in, in, in Michigan. And, and that's, in some ways, that's a tell. Um, we at the National Democratic Redistricting Committee support independent commissions, you know, it takes power away from state legislators to draw, um, draw the lines, draw the maps. You never see Republicans say that they support independent commissions, again, because that takes power away from them and makes it more likely that you're going to see um, fairness. So reform measures are, are things that we have done. So that, 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 you know, that, that conglomeration of, um, of, of techniques um, and, and strategies, I think, is what has gotten us to the place um, you know, where, we are, where we are now. I'm curious what you make of, you know, I, I sense on the left, you know, not, not Democrats, yes, but, but, but really uh, liberals even more so uh, within, within the Democratic Party, um, a fundamental discomfort with electing judges. You know, and I have to say, like, I even have a little bit of, like, you know, wouldn't it be an ideal system if we didn't elect judges? Uh, um, but I don't know whether that's antiquated. You know, I don't know if, if, if maybe that's actually, now that I see some of the judges that Donald Trump appointed, uh, I have a greater appreciation for elected judges. But what do you tell people who look at, who, who look at these judicial elections and worry about, you know, the involvement of, of, you know, sort of more partisan things in elections. I mean, the, the North Carolina Supreme Court is probably the most egregious court in the country, in my view, you know, what, what you've seen there. Uh, 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 and so I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, is it just that we need to get comfortable with the rules as they are and just, you know, elect, you know, be more involved? Because it does seem like the left is less engaged in the election of judges generally than the right is. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, in a perfect world, um, I, I think you'd have, you know, not judicial nominating commissions that would look at best candidates and mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, send to a governor, you know, three candidates um, from which you can pick um, you know, who should serve on the state Supreme Court. It's interesting. That's what we have here in Washington, D.C. Huh. One of the ways in which I became a superior court judge appointed by, hold on to your hats now, Ronald Reagan. Um, you know, <laughs> Who do? Yeah, you were exactly. a Reagan appointee. Exactly. You know, um, I, I always used to, when we go up to testify or something, I always tried to work that into, you know, some kind of response when I was getting attacked by the Republicans. It's like, hey, Dutch put me on the bench, guys. You know? <laughs> Um, so that, I think, is in some ways, you know, the best system, but not one we're likely to see in places where I think judicial elections have become kind of part of the fabric of, um, you know, of, of the state. And if that is the case, then I think that we've got to get over our distaste for that, our, our uncomfortability with that, and we have got to engage. And I, I think that what we saw with Judge, uh, now Justice, um, Janet Protasewicz in Wisconsin and the campaign that, that she waged there is in some ways a textbook example uh, of the way in which um, an, a judicial election campaign um, should, uh, should go about, should, should be done. Um, you know, she said, without crossing any lines, she said that, you know, I think these maps that, we're, that exist now in Wisconsin are rigged. They're not, they're not, they're not fair. It's not going out on a limb there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of like, <laughs> objectively, you could say that. Um, and then she talked about, you know, reproductive rights and how, you know, unless something was done, an 1849 law would be would govern reproductive rights in Wisconsin when uh, women didn't have the right to vote. People like me obviously didn't have the right to vote. Um, and you, you saw her win in a 50-50 state, win by 11 points. Wow. Um, and I, I think, you know, so again, the ideal is, you know, a nice, a neutral selection process, but failing that, uh, we have got to get over our discomfort with elected um, judges and justices 
and um, you know, get out there and make sure that we campaign for the people who will interpret their constitutions um, in the most fair way uh, and not be beholden um, to special interests. Because the reality is our lack of engagement has resulted in some of some, in certain instances, certain states, you know, some of the worst Supreme Courts that you could um, that you could imagine. And so we're going to be focusing on over the course of this coming decade, uh, you know, a whole range of state um, Supreme Court um, Supreme Court races. And it's also why the election of uh, Joe Biden is so important for uh, another term. Um, you know, it, there's possibilities that we'll have one or two openings on the Supreme Court. There's a whole range of um, appellate and trial court judges in the, in the federal system that will have to be made. And the question I think you know, voters need to ask themselves, who do you want making those selections, Donald Trump or, um, or, or Joe Biden? That's an important, important part of the, um, the 2024 presidential election. All right. I got to ask you what may seem like a very wonky question, but it is at Democracy Docket. It is one of the things our readers and our, our viewers focus a lot on, and that is the Republican effort to curtail private right of action of enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. And you are in uh, literally, I cannot, ima- I cannot think of a person with a more, uh, a more ideal perch to opine on this because you have been the Attorney General of the United States when the department was bringing Voting Rights Act cases and seeing private litigants bring Voting Rights Act cases. As uh, the head of NDRC, you are one of the pro- most prolific uh, uh, supporters of uh, of Voting Rights Act cases that have made real differences to voters, you know, in Alabama, in Louisiana, in Georgia, and elsewhere. You know, you're talking about not theoretical differences, but real on-the-ground tangible differences that absent the ability of private litigants to bring these cases, they simply would not have been brought and the harms would still be in place. So I'm just, um, I'm curious, what is your take? You know, I've never, I've never obviously asked uh, Attorney General Garland this or um, anyone in the Department of Justice. Is it appreciated? Like, do, do the, like on the outside, we see private, right, we see the private litigants bringing Section 2 cases as a vital component of, of enforcing the Voting Rights Act. Does the department see it that way? Like, how do you see the balance between what the department does regarding Section 2 versus what the private um, uh, the civil rights organizations and private litigants do? When, when I was attorney general, I certainly saw the value of private litigants when it came to um, Section 2 litigation. The reality is the Justice Department doesn't have the resources to bring all the cases in all the places uh, where these uh, these suits need to be brought. I mean, the Voting Rights Act was passed, I guess, 58, 59 years ago. Um, you know, there have been 182 successful Section 2 challenges filed over the last uh, 40 years or so. Only 15, or approximately 8%, have been brought were brought by the United States Department of Justice. You know, the victory that we had we had in Alabama was a case that was brought by a group of Alabama voters, a private lawsuit. Um, in Alabama, the U.S. Supreme Court, even with its, you know, its current radically um, conservative majority, upheld the lower court's decision, which was also brought by private plaintiffs. Same thing in Louisiana. Um, and it's interesting, you know, the Fifth Circuit ruled that Section 2 challenges brought by um, private parties are, in fact, um, permissible. Yep. These judges on the Eighth Circuit somehow <laughs> discovered something long lost um, in the, <laughs> the history uh, of the Voting Rights Act uh, that no one ever saw before. And I think what they, the, at both the trial level and at the appellate level, what they're doing is nonsense. Um, this was, um, you know, a, at the trial court level, a, a, out of the norm move by a Trump appointed judge. You know, neither party even asked right. for, you know, the case to be viewed in that way or that put that question before the court. Um, and so, you know, the reality is this has not stopped, you know, pending voting rights litigation brought by par- private parties outside of the Eighth Circuit, such as in, in, in Texas. But I will tell you this, if, if this happened, if this was to be applied nationwide, if the Supreme Court were to say, you know, whoa, actually, yeah, there is no right to bring um, private actions under, under Section 2. Uh, again, 60 years or so after the, after the act, um, this would deny millions of American citizens, I think, the ability to, to directly seek justice. You know, American citizens, not dependent on the Justice Department, American citizens, uh, the ability, deny their ability to directly seek justice in a court 
um, you know, where their right to equal voting power and representation is violated. So think about that. You know, when a citizen's rights are violated, they won't be able to take it to court themselves. They'd have to wait for a Justice Department to get involved. And as we all know, not every Justice Department is going to be headed by Eric Holder or by my Merrick Garland. I can't imagine what a Justice Department headed by, you know, a Bill Barr or a Bill Barr clone, a Jeff Sessions. You know, what would they do? Um, you remember so, Ed Meese, right? Could you imagine Ed, Ed Meese? You know, um, and that would effectively allow you know legislatures kind of free reign to force discriminatory maps, you know, onto people, just as we saw in Alabama, in Georgia, in Louisiana, in Texas. Um, you know, not because it's legal. But because, you know, the wheels of justice turn, you know, and sometimes too slowly to keep up with the, I'll just say, you know, racist, unethical, anti-democratic, um, you know, politicians. And so having that private right of action is critical, critical, not only to make sure that um, the Voting Rights Act is seen in the way that uh, those who put it into place wanted it to be viewed, but also to protect our democracy and to most especially um, protect uh, minority citizens in this uh, in this nation when it comes to the electoral process. So you have been um, a student of history and you have been part of history. And I'm wondering, what did you think when you witnessed the state of Alabama essentially replicating, standing at the courthouse doors, refusing to enforce a court order, um, uh, you know, arms crossed, refusing to uh, abide by a court order requiring it to draw a second majority black district. You know, I, 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 I don't have the historical perspective that you you do, but I was, I was struck that a lot of what Chief Justice Roberts said had changed in the South, um, had not really changed. No, I, you know, I'd be interested to have a really you know good conversation with the Chief Justice, and you know, when he talked in Shelby the Shelby County case about how America has changed. Say, well, in light of all that's happened since that 2013 abomination of a decision, um, what do you think? I mean, do you think that America has changed? Now, gee, yeah, America certainly has changed and in progress has been made, but we're not yet near the place where um, we need to be. And, you know, what struck me about Alabama was both um, historical and personal. Um, you know, the young black woman who integrated the University of Alabama when George Wallace stood in the, uh, the, the schoolhouse door was my late sister-in-law, Vivian Malone. Um, you know, she and James Hood were the two black students who, um, through the, the force of the Justice Department, the National Guard, Robert Kennedy, um, Nicholas Katzenbach, were allowed to um, enroll at the state university where their families had been resident for, you know, generations. Um, and to see the Alabama legislature respond to another court order, this one from an ultra-conservative Supreme Court, uh, to redraw the lines there so that African Americans would have the ability to select um, a sufficient number of people uh, who would represent their, their views, had a it, it struck me. I mean, it really, really struck me. It's like, you know, America's changed, but it hasn't changed um, nearly enough. And what I'm seeing in Alabama, um, you know, over the course of the last few months strikes me as really kind of consistent with the Alabama that I saw as a young boy in, you know, 1963, watching it um, on, on television and then hearing about it from, as I said, my late, my late sister-in-law. And that, I think, is something that we need to keep in mind. You know, this notion that somehow or other all things are solved, um, that race is no longer uh, a prime determinant in our life in a whole range of issues. Um, electoral you know, is what we're talking about here. That's just not real. That's just not where America is right now. Yes, we have made progress, but progress at this point is, I think, simply not enough. I mean, when do we get to those end states of equality and justice? That's where, um, you know, where we need to, need to be. Um, you know, I think about this Kind of personally, I mean, my father was born in the 1900s, my mother was born in the 1920s, I was born in the 1950s, my kids were born in the 1990s. You know, at what point do we not be satisfied with progress, but to demand those end states of equality and justice? You know, yeah, this country is better than it was when my dad was 
you know, a young boy. Um, but we're not, just look at what's happened in, in, in Alabama over the course of the last, what, 12, 18 months. Um, yeah. We're still, we're still uh, you know, we're still not there. So you wrote an important book recently, um, and I encourage everyone to go buy it. It's called Our Unfinished March. And I'm curious why, why, why you thought this was the time to write that book. Yeah, because I really do. I wrote it because I think um, a couple of reasons. One, I think our democracy is really at risk. Um, you know, we in America, I think, tend to take for granted um, our democratic system, our, our democracy. We, we tend to take it for granted. And when we see things happen in other countries, we say, well, that couldn't happen here in the United States. And I think there's a lesson in history that we need to look at it. You look at Europe um, in the 20th century. Uh, you know, we saw um, fascism and communism rise um, in Europe in the early part of the 20th century, not because fascism and communism were strong, but because the defense of democracy was weak. Right. And unless we have a strong defense of democracy here, I think we can see our democratic institutions um, really eroded. It doesn't mean we perhaps we'd have a dictator. I, I don't know. Um, but our elections, two years, four years, six years, eight years could be rendered almost um, almost meaningless. And so I wanted to talk about um, those issues. And what I wanted to do in the book was to um, give people some historical perspective about you know, what it took for various groups of people to get the right to vote. Um, and it's always interesting when people read the book and say, well, I didn't understand that the first group of people to seek the right to vote were white men who didn't have property and who were denied the opportunity um, to vote. That was, that was the first group that organized and said, we want the right to vote, white men who didn't have property. So we talk about the history of the acquisition of the vote, um, kind of where we stand now with regard to the threats to our democracy. And then the last part of the book deals with some concrete proposals um, about how we can improve our democracy and ensure that um, you know, this American ideal, that the people rule, can actually be something that um, that is true here in this uh, in this nation in the 21st century. Well, it's a great book. I've read it and I recommend it to everyone. A.G. Holder, um, maybe one of the things that gives me hope is that you have uh, decided that you are going to keep at redistricting for a while. Um, as you point out, redistricting is not a once every decade activity. It now seemingly is a uh, 365 day a year, every year uh, activity. And so you recently announced you're going to stay, which is one of the things that gives me hope when people ask. Uh, I'll ask you later what gives you hope. Um, uh, but, uh, but talk about with the ability to have a little bit of time. You know, you took this on without a lot of lead time before the next round of redistricting. Um, by announcing now that you're going to be doing this for a while, uh, it has allowed you to lay out kind of a longer runway um, uh, and plan. So talk a little bit about how you think, wh how, what needs to be done between now and 2030, 2032, and kind of how you see 2030 slash 32, you know, playing out better, hopefully, for America. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we have to stop doing is think about thinking about this issue um, episodically. Uh, we have to commit ourselves to, you know, what I call the long game. And that's why I, I'm committed to staying with the NDRC through the course of this decade and focus on what happens in 2031, the next time we do redistricting. But also, as I said, in this era of perpetual redistricting, make sure that I'm, I'm still there to keep things fair leading up to um, 2031. And so I'm going to stick with NDRC and its affiliates, you know, for the decade. And, you know, we've got a plan, not only again to fight against these efforts that we are, you know, that they we're dealing with right now, these anti-democracy efforts right now, we're fighting those. But we also need to put in place something for that 2030 redistricting cycle. Um, so over the next decade, we're going to try to protect fair maps and the redistricting reforms that we have, you know, that we have put in place. We want to prevent future gerrymandering attempts. And then we want to promote redistricting reforms in more states to take power out of politicians' hands. And so I think there are five critical components. Um, strategic political and electoral engagement throughout the course of the decade, um, a robust strategy for impactful litigation, um, advancing redistricting reforms and, and policy changes at both the state and federal level, 
um, developing state-of-the-art mapping capabilities. Um, you know, we got out technology in 2011. Uh, how does AI play in, you know, for instance, in, in, in mapping um, in, in this decade? So focus on that as well. And then finally, you know, grassroots mobilization and public education. We talked about this before, making sure that the American people continue to keep in their minds the notion that um, gerrymandering, inappropriate redistricting um, has an impact on their day-to-day -day lives. And um, so I think with those five, hopefully my involvement, President Obama has said that this is going to be his chief political involvement in the coming decade as well. Uh, so with the two of us, with great lawyers um, led by you, I, I think that we can make uh, this decade, uh, we can continue the progress that we have made and then make 2031 even better than 2021 was. And so the New York Times will hopefully say that it was not just the fairest in 40 years, but said maybe just say it was fair. And that's what I'd like to get to, that end state. Simply say that the redistricting process um, was fair. Do you worry about the census? Um, maybe the answer is, of course, everyone worries, should worry about the census. But I, it seems like the Republicans are constantly attacking the census. I am really worried about the census, um, and I would not have if you, I would I would have answered that question differently before the last census. Um, in the handoff from the Bush um, um, administration to the Obama administration, you know, census was seen as something it's just good government, just count all right. count, count all the people. Um, the census count is a bedrock for all sorts of policy making as well as our electoral process, including redistricting. And, and without a good count, you can't have fair maps. And we saw during the Trump years not only a delay in the census due to the pandemic, but a real effort. And this is like a first, you know, by the Trump administration to, the, to use the census. And again, typically, it's all about nonpartisan data acquisition. They tried to use the census for um, partisan purposes. Uh, and they did this by attempting things like, you know, add, adding a citizenship question, you know, to the, to the census. Uh, and when you consider, you know, the terror that the, the, the Trump administration inflicted upon um, you know, immigrant communities, communities of color, you know, the foreseeable impact of the addition of this question was clear. You know, whole communities were going to be scared away from mm -hmm. participating in this critical, you know, government exercise. And that's not, the, the Constitution says you count all the people, all the inhabitants. You don't say count citizens. Um, and so, you know, we challenged the citizenship question. We won, went to the Supreme Court. Um, but I think Republicans are, you know, they're reviving this effort. Um, you know, conservative groups like the Heritage Foundation have included you know, the, the citizenship question already is part of their Project 2025 agenda, which is a plan for dismantling parts of the uh, of the U.S. U.S. government. So, I'm really worried about um, the census based on what the Trump administration did and what uh, conservative groups are planning to do with the census for uh, you know in in the next decade. So I to already gave you my answer, which is that what gives me hope is that you're going to be at this for a while longer. But, you know, people want to know, <clears throat> with all of the challenges to voting, all of the all of the gerrymandering, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast really, really despondent about the South Carolina situation, you know, really, you know, felt like the courts were imperfect, but were at least standing up to the worst aspects of disenfranchisement. And here's the Supreme Court letting these illegal maps disenfranchise uh, and really discriminate, racially discriminate against black voters. So against all of that, like, what gives you hope? What do you tell people they should be hopeful about? Well, you know, the thing is for me, Mark, is that you've got to be optimistic because optimism, I think, breeds involvement. Um, pessimism um, breeds inaction. And so I'm, that's kind of how I'm wired. Um, but I think there's also um, there's demonstrable proof that, you know, an engaged focused uh, American citizenry brings about the kind of change that this nation is capable of. You know, if you look at the book, you know, Un Unfinished March, um, women didn't get the right to vote simply because it was time. Um, they got the vote because they fought for it. Um, a system of American apartheid was ripped down and black folks got, really got the right to vote in the, in the mid 60s because Dr. King, Diane Nash, John Lewis, um, decided to take on and, as I said, pull down a system of American apartheid. And they had to think, you know, at some point, the women, um, those civil rights icons, can we really do this? Um, 
can we really pull this off? And I'm sure they must have had doubts, but they remained optimistic and committed. Um, and so that's what keeps me in this era, optimistic and committed. And in addition to that, uh, as I walk, as I go around the country and, and talk to young people, um, I am more optimistic about this coming generation than I think um, many people are. They are focused on a lot of issues. They are engaged in ways that I don't think that they get credit for. So I think the this new generation coupled with um, a, a real knowledge of our, our, our history and the ability of the American people to chart their own path, um, in spite of enormous challenges, is the thing that, um, you know, that gives me hope. But I also understand that positive change is not promised. It's the result of commitment, sacrifice, um, and, and hard work and perseverance. And uh, if, we, if we do all those things, I, I think we can, um, we can be successful. And I think the last thing to people to remember is that there's joy in the struggle. Huh. You know, that um, the engagement with other people to fight for fairness, um, for equality, for justice, there's joy in that. And I don't think we should lose, um, lose sight of that. You talk to John Lewis, you know, my, uh, a good friend, um, and he talked about some of the best years in his life or some of the most difficult times when the struggle was at its most intense, that there was real joy in the camaraderie and this notion of common purpose. And so I think uh, we should not forget that there's joy in this, uh, in this struggle. Well, what a remarkable words. Thank you, Attorney General Holder, for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. To find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Ali Rothenberg, Gabby Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Gabby Corporal and Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.